vice president said, well, we will. We will think outside the box. And I saw this cover on South Dakota Alive, Arts Alive publication that had this beautiful dance right in the cover. And so I thought, I'm gonna call her and have her describe how dance is part of art. And art is the universal language of dance. So I would like to, without further ado, introduce Madeline Scott. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Madeline Scott, and I am the founder and artistic director of South Dakota Ballet. With me today is my mother, Ruth Scott. She serves as one of the founding board members for the organization and also our treasurer and our physical therapist for when all the professional dancers come to town. So she wears many hats, as do I, and we make a great team. So she might jump in as well um, today as we talk about this organization. Um, you know, art is the universal language of dance. Dance has been something I have fallen in love with since a child. Um, the moment I could walk was the moment I started dancing. And I grew up in Beersford, South Dakota, South of Sioux Falls. I don't know how many times you get to Beersford, but it's a small community. And at the time, there was a dance studio. And I started taking dance around the age of 10. As you can see on this image, that is me at age 10. And here's me two, a couple weeks ago at age 28, doing the same thing. <laughs> so I fell in love with dance, and unfortunately there wasn't a large dance program in our small community, and so I expressed my love for this art form to my mom and said, you know, this is something I need to do. It's not something I have to do or something I want to do. It's something I need to do. What can you do to help me become better at this art form? I was not very talented at my young age. Um, and fortunately, my mother made time to take me to Sioux Falls and enrolled me in ballet class. I entered my first ballet class. I was terrified, pink tights, black leotard, hair in a bun, just like that picture. And they were speaking in French. I had no idea what was going on. And I felt completely out of my comfort zone. But when I walked out of that ballet class, I looked at my mom and I said, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And so I'm proud to say that I'm still doing that. I am currently a dancer with Dance Aspen out in Colorado, and I perform full time as my career. So I'm very, very honored to have that opportunity. And most of my touring is in Colorado at the moment, but with South Dakota Ballet, we are starting to bring world-class performances to communities throughout South Dakota. And so growing up as a dancer in South Dakota, I was very, um, I guess, sheltered from the opportunities that dancers were receiving in the big metropolitan cities. Um, we did not have any professional training programs here when I was a young dancer. And so after my first ballet class at age 10, we were looking for the next steps. I was starting to show I did actually have talent, I just didn't have the right training. And I was dedicated and I was practicing. And so I went to my mom, what do we do next? And she, actually looked up, you know, using the internet when we used to have dial-up, and um, looked up a ballet competition. And she found me a coach in New York City and said, let's try it, let's see how it goes. You know, you've done all these local dance competitions, how many more plastic trophies can you win? Who cares? Let's get into the art form. Let's take it to the next level. And so she took me to New York City to train with a woman named Elena Kunikova. And she was a very um, well-renowned um, classical ballerina from Russia. And she took me under her wing and told my mom, well, the first private lesson was not very good. I left in tears. I was so traumatized. I thought finally I had made it to New York and I was gonna just take off. And I didn't even understand at that point what kind of work it would take. <laughs> and my mom was sitting outside the studio and she could hear all the yelling going on. Who has taught you this way? You know, oh, it was just absolutely um, intimidating. But we stepped out of the studio together, and my mom was at the door kind of grinning, because she thought it was kind of entertaining. And she said, well, you know, my daughter does like soccer and other sports. We could always go back to something else. And the woman, Elena, told my mother, the girl has talent. I will train the baby. And she took me under my wing, <laughs> and she got me into 
American Ballet Theater's Young Dancer Workshop. I was the first dancer from South Dakota to attend, and that is me here in this black leotard. Um, after that, the rest was history. I decided that this was what I was going to do, and I competed in that world ballet competition, trained by Elena, my new dance coach in New York. We went to New York uh, once every five weeks or so in preparation for Youth America Grand Prix, the world's largest scholarship ballet competition. No one had ever competed from South Dakota ballet, or from South Dakota, and so I felt the pressure to perform well and to represent our state well. And fortunately, I did place at the regionals, and we showed up um, very unprepared, I'd say. We were inexperienced. We didn't have the experience of the other competitors. They had you know, full wardrobe teams, full hair and makeup teams, and we showed up with my tutu and a trash bag. We were, in, <laughs> we were um, uneducated at the time, but we've grown so much since then, and I fortunately was awarded a scholarship to attend a full-time ballet school at age 13 in Philadelphia. And my mom agreed to let me go. That was the most exciting part. She said, we can try it and we can see. If it doesn't go well, you can always come home. It's a beautiful part. And so on my 13th birthday, I flew out to Philadelphia and started my boarding school at the Rock School for Dance Education, where I danced six days a week. I had to transfer to online school so that I could um, continue with my academics and all of my AP classes. Um, and then after that, I went to New York City at age 15, continued training, continued working. And then that's where I lived in a convent with nuns, which was kind of fun. Um, that was my mother's agreement. If you're moving to New York City, you're going to live in the convent with the nuns. And so I took the trade. We had a really good time. Um, and I started auditioning around age 17 and finally was blessed to be hired into uh, Ballet West. And that is located a big professional ballet company, large scale in um, Salt Lake City, Utah. So, also in Salt Lake City is the University of Utah School of Dance, a fabulous program, which um, I decided to join after a couple months in Salt Lake City. And this image is from my time at University of Utah, performing the role of Cinderella with a live orchestra, custom wardrobe. Um, I graduated from their program with my BFA in ballet pedagogy. And I started dancing professionally from there. So I did earn my degree, and I'm very, very blessed to have had my education. That program has absolutely shaped who I am today as an artist, as a creator, as an entrepreneur, and I just feel so much more equipped to be out in the world as a professional artist, making it my full-time living. I'm very grateful. And while I was there, I also studied nonprofits and community engagement. So that was a new thing they added to the political science department just when I started, like a year after I was there, so my sophomore year. I was just, it seemed like the stars kind of aligned for me to start preparing and paving the way for South Dakota Ballet during that time. And so I was hired to, for a variety of different companies, mostly classical ballet. I worked with Ballet West, you know, 32 dancers, very large ballet company. I worked with Sacramento Ballet, kind of a medium-sized ballet company. I enjoyed that one as well. Um, I worked for a couple different contemporary companies, and I've performed at Vail Dance Festival now twice, which is the lar world's largest um, dance festival. It's just an exciting event every year that takes place over two weeks in Vail, Colorado, so not too far from where I'm living, fortunately. Um, so I'm used to the altitude, which helps a lot. <laughs> but this picture of me in this crazy orange costume was actually last season at Vail Dance Festival, and um, it's been a really great journey. So while I spent so much time traveling around and working for different companies outside of the state, I kept thinking, I really miss my family. I want to be closer to home. I want to share what I'm doing with the people I love and my friends from school and people I grew up with who supported my journey, but they're never gonna be able to travel to come see me perform somewhere else. And while I was in my training in my younger years, I always thought there will be a professional company in South Dakota. There has to be. And I didn't even think that, hey, you know, I was 23 when we opened the company, um, that it would be me doing the groundwork. <laughs> I'd always hoped I'd be able to return and join a dance company here in South Dakota and be performing in Rapid City and Sioux Falls and Aberdeen and Brookings and all these towns, and um, unfortunately never happened. We were the last state in America to get a professional ballet company. Wow. And so that's when that conversation emerged. I was with my mom and 
I just woke up one day, literally, and said, what do we do? And she says, if not you, then who? Let's go for it. Let's just figure it out. So she, you know, really motivated me, motivated me to take this on. Um, I definitely felt like um, in our first few months, like many organizations, I was building a plane while flying it. That's the only way to explain how I felt. I had never hosted, you know, flown in professional dancers from all over the world and put together programming and, um, you know, launched educational outreach programming. It was all new for me, and all I knew um, was from what I had experienced in my um, experience as a professional dancer at Ballet West, outreach programming, and at the university. I'm very proud that we're at this place now. So here comes South Dakota Ballet. I opened the company in May 2019, which was not ideal timing considering the year following. But you know what? We did a great job of pivoting, just like everyone. We offered online education, because we had done extensive fundraising at this point, with hopes of launching a big inaugural black tie, red carpet gala, um, very extravagant and fun, and um, unfortunately that was canceled, of course. And we had support from artists from all over the world. The moment we launched this, professional dancers from all over the world said, we want to support you, we know your story, we saw where you came from, you know, you came from this small dance studio in South Dakota, and you're out competing against dancers with the most resources. Um, at those big um, ballet competitions and up for jobs eventually. And so my friends gathered around from far and wide to support me and even offered to perform um, for free at very heavily discounted rates. And fortunately, we were able to raise money to be able to pay everyone a very fair wage when they came. And they finally did get to come in 20, um, October 2020 was our very first performance. We did a socially distanced performance at the Washington Pavilion with seven artists some of which were from American Ballet Theater, which is one of the largest professional dance companies in the world, based in New York City, Lincoln Center. And they graciously came here and hung out with my mom and I in Beersford and performed at the pavilion. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to share a little clip of some of the classical ballet that we presented at um, this last, or the, our first show. This is a variation from Don Quixote. It is called, Teaching. <laughs> they were. Everyone was so thrilled, and that was one of my favorite parts about this is myself performing the role of Kitri from Don Quixote, and we just shared different excerpts from classical ballet so that we could use this as an educational opportunity for our audience members. We wanted to explain to them what to expect when attending the ballet and what um, being a professional dancer is and what it's not. Being a professional dancer is rehearsing full time, being in the studio all day every day, and training like a professional athlete in preparation for performance. You know, we're not dance teachers, although I, as many of us are, many of us do on the side. I own a dance studio in Yankton, actually, so I do teach um, around. And many of us are choreographers, but that is not the job. The job is performing full time. So that was a very exciting um, moment to be able to share this with everybody. and. Um, it was just kind of my dream come true, finally. So let's see if we can go back there anyway. Okay, 
And then, with that in mind, I just want to talk a little bit about South Dakota Valley and what we've done as an organization since we started. We have had six performances in three different cities. We've performed in Sioux Falls, Rapid City, and Aberdeen. And we have hired 33 dancers in total. And we've hired over 76 artists in our lifespan. So that makes me very proud. We're paying people acceptable wages. We're not asking them to cut corners for their artwork. And I'm very proud of that. It's a lot of work. We've had 19 musicians. Our performance last year did feature a full live orchestra utilizing members of the South Dakota Symphony Orchestra, which added a whole other level to our performances. And it was greatly appreciated by our audience. We have presented 29 choreographic works. That is more than many companies do um, in several years, full-time dance companies. So that's incredible considering we are a part-time dance company. We gather during the off season when all of the high caliber professional dancers are on layoff, on their breaks. Um, so it's really incredible that we've been able to do that in that short amount of time. 14 of these 29 choreographic works were world premieres, which is very um, cool to be presenting brand new um, groundbreaking works here in South Dakota. You know, we're not doing antiquated works, we're doing new things and definitely pushing the boundaries as to what dance is and what contemporary dance is and classical ballet. So we also have educational outreach programming. This is a massive component of who we are at South Dakota Ballet. Every summer we host a summer intensive, just like I attended as a young dancer, so we can create those professional opportunities for dancers here in South Dakota. We've offered them, this is our fourth one here in Sioux Falls. We've also offered a summer intensive in, or sorry, there in Sioux Falls. And we offered one in Rapid City, which was well received. And we've had over 160 students in the past four years. So we're making a difference. We're making an impact and the dancers have blossomed. Watching the dancers who've come to our program, they're dancing at a much more professional level than they would have had they not come. So I'm very, very pleased with how the program is working. Our program is unique in that the dancers, the children, work with the professional dancers very closely. They get to interact with the professional dancers. The other programs around the country, you're working with um, ballet mistresses, maybe um, people who haven't performed in a long time, who are perhaps maybe not even involved in the industry as much anymore. But at our program, we're immersing these kids in the professional environment. I believe Eric had a dog for our program, so. Yeah, yeah, in our program a couple years ago. Yep, two years ago. Yep, and I think she had a good experience. I oh, hope. she loved it, yeah. Good, I'm so glad. That makes yeah. me so happy. And I went to the performance and it was beautiful. Thank you, thank you for coming and supporting. I appreciate it. We integrate the students from our summer intensive into the opening of our, of our performances. So they actually open the entire show. We have the children open the performance so that they can see the professionals rehearsing backstage, see us preparing for a show, and see what kind of focus and dedication it takes. So it's been really cool to see um, South Dakota Ballet doing this. No other companies in the world are doing it. So I'm very proud of this. We've done many outreach programs. I offered free dance community classes throughout Sioux Falls and Brandon. That was really fun for a couple of summers. And we've gone to Hill City, Lake Andes, Beersford and also Sioux Falls and Brandon for outdoor free performances. And those have been really well received. This image down here is me with the young dancers who came to see our show in Lake Candies. And then moving forward, we would like to bring our recent premiere, 11 Rules for Being Human, to Brookings. <laughs> this is our goal. Now this performance was considered our most daring yet life-changing performance yet. And I mean, it was a whirlwind. It is an extremely emotionally riveting performance. You will leave feeling absolutely touched in your heart and your soul after leaving this performance. Mm -hmm. It was something um, that I was starting to plan the performance for our fall tour um, earlier this summer. And I kept thinking, what, what, what are we gonna do? I have no idea what we're gonna do. And, I was talking with one of my co-directors, Blake Craples from Philadelphia, and I happened to pick up the stack of papers. I was cleaning my office out, and I picked up Cherie um, Scott's rules for being human. And I said, this is it, let's do this. Why not do this? 
it's not too precious. It's, we won't be too intimidated to tackle this project. Let's just go for it. And it turned out to be one of the most magnificent experiences as a dancer, as a producer, as a choreographer, and as you know, a stage director that I've ever had. So I'm really hoping that we can bring this to Brookings for everyone to experience it in 2024. It'll be updated, it'll be fresh. Um, we'll keep working on it between now and then when we bring it. Um, it was very well received. Our goal was to create a long, I know there's a very interesting image on there. <laughs> that is my friend Sammy in a very creative costume. That is me dragging her onto the stage. It is. <laughs> Um, it's a very creative contemporary ballet work, and there's lots of theatrics. You'll see lots of acting. You'll see lots of abstract theatricality, set designs, costuming, um, and the lighting is one of the most important components for us. This work turned out to be 50, 42 minutes in duration, and it involved six professional dancers, and we were able to promote five local young dancers as a, to be apprentices and actually perform with the professional company this year. So that was a huge, huge um, moment of excitement for me to be able to actually see our young dancers in South Dakota become professionals and be on the stage with the professional dancers. They were from Rapid City, Sioux Falls, Aberdeen, and um, Freeman. So very cool. And we performed this in Sioux Falls and Aberdeen. Hopefully we'll be in Brookings in 2024. That is our goal. And this piece involves 17 different pieces of music and soundscapes that I put together as an audio engineer. So that is something I've also learned to do. And I would say the soundscape, the, the music we used in this performance was one of the things that audience members commented on. They said, I could not believe the music that was used in this. There's classical music. There's contemporary um, violin music. There's, you know, Aretha Franklin. You know, it's, it has everything. Something for everybody, which is why I feel like this piece is really accurate in depicting dance as a universal language. Every person who walks in the auditorium will feel something after seeing this. Um, one of our other goals was to help educate the dancers that we're bringing in. So these are world-class, um, top 25, top 100 in the world dancers that we're bringing in. But when you're a professional dancer, you are a professional mannequin in some ways. So a choreographer comes in and they tell you exactly how to move, when to blink, how to hold your pinky finger, and on what count to do it. You don't get to make decisions about how you're going to move. You're hired to do their work. So we wanted to take these high level professionals that were working in these large companies and give them the opportunity to grow professionally as choreographers and also to learn how to light a piece. So the lighting of the show is extremely important. And it's something that we spend a lot of time on. So lighting the piece to really bring the dramatic flair to it. And so these dancers that we bring in have never had the opportunity to do that or to call a show. Have any of you worked backstage at a big show before? So you're on a headset, you're talking with your stage manager up in the booth, so you know the booth that's up at the top of the pavilion. That's where your lighting is coming from. You've got a sound engineer there. And so you're on a headset backstage and there's all kinds of cues that are going on, thousands of cues. So. Um, all of those are programmed into the light board and into the sound. And you're saying, you know, you're, when you're on the headset, you're hearing cue this, curtain in, out, you know, constantly. Every three or four seconds, there's a different cue going on. And so someone has set all of that up. And these dancers are learning how to do that. Of course, Madeline's in charge of all of it, but and she has helpers backstage. I, I'm curtain woman. <laughs> but, um, but calling the show is, is a real skill. And if you haven't been taught how to do that, if you started dancing professionally when you were 17, you would never have had a place to do that. And you're not going to say, if you're a dancer for American Ballet Theater, you're not going to go up and say, could you teach me how to light the show? <laughs> you know, that's not your job. So, and, and when we get in big theaters, you're dealing with union members, you're not allowed to do anything. So I am starting to, after the Aberdeen experience, where we basically had the 
theater to ourselves and we ran the theater ourselves. I'm liking the idea of going to a smaller theater or a smaller town because we really were able to do some things and teach some things even to our apprentices. So the young women that were selected to be apprentices with us this year, they learned how to lower um, sets and things like that. And so they learned how to assist in the show. Yeah, it was really unique to produce a show entirely by dancers. This entire piece that you're about to see little excerpts of was produced by the dancers who are the professionals actually performing the works, which is something I've never done in my career, having danced with professional ballet companies. But South Dakota Ballet is creating unique opportunities for professionals um, to try new things. So this is a little excerpt of the opening of our piece. There's an Edison bulb on stage that um, magically floats between spaces. Um, it's hanging stationary. Sometimes it's moving up and down. Sometimes it's handheld. Um, it's very theatrical and different. I think people were very surprised to see this type of work. And that is Blake, my co-director. And one of the professional dancers I dance with the most, and that is Andy. She is from Philadelphia, originally from Orange County. And that is Zach and Juliet Doherty. Juliet is a, a famous movie star who is one of my closest friends now. And she comes here to teach at our summer intensives to perform with us. We put the entire performance together, including the first act of the show, in 48 hours. So I will say that was very, I guess, impressive, intimidating, and I was extremely pleased with the quality that we were able to bring in that short amount of time, because obviously with budgets and other constraints, that is something you wanna prioritize as being punctual. We had strobe lights, that was different for many people to see at the ballet. but. It was definitely one of our most engaging pieces. That is Blake and I in the closing number, um, dancing to Aretha Franklin. Um, definitely a powerful moment in the performance. <laughs> so we finally have a trusted group of artists that we feel like we can create masterpieces with. It's taking some experimentation to find who are the right people we want to work with? What kind of people do we want to work with? Dance is unique because you're working with people. You're not working with clay. You're not working with paint. Just like any live art form, the material you're working with has lots of different variables and it's always under construction. And that is one reason I love being a dancer and love being a person who does live performances. Every time you come back to a piece of choreography or you know, a play, a song, it's different every time. And that is the most unique thing about being a professional dancer and that the audience can feel that when you're in the audience. You can feel like the tension on stage, the tension between dancers and your brain is always seeking to find a story, always, immediately. When you have two bodies in space, you have six bodies, seven bodies, you're trying to find a story. And so it's just a really special thing to be able to do this. This is the performance we hope to bring to Brookings in 2024. And I will be fundraising for this over the next few months, and we've already started. We're able to already secure um, a couple thousand dollars moving for our 2024 campaign, and we're a long ways to go. Um, but I believe that we can do it, and I believe that this performance should be here in Brookings. And we'll get to my closing remarks. And we have some beautiful, beautiful, beautiful um, sponsors and support. It definitely would not be possible what we do here at South Dakota Ballet without all of these amazing sponsors who have supported us since day one, especially Miles and Lisa Beacom. Since the moment I decided that this is gonna, was gonna happen, they supported me in many different ways. Um, and we wouldn't be here without that. So I hope that we can continue to grow this group um, who sees the vision and therefore be able to bring South Dakota Ballet to other communities around South Dakota.
and to help young dancers achieve their dreams of becoming professional dancers and interacting with professional dancers and provide a strict, like, very important part of the arts that hasn't been represented in South Dakota until now. So. Thank you all so much for having me. We will have some time for some questions. Margaret. It isn't a question, but um, maybe you may know this. The South Dakota Humanities Company is beginning to do interviews across uh, South Dakota to help us understand what people are doing. And it's not all agriculture. Or all sports. I love that. <laughs> but it's arts and humanity. And they have listed it. Uh, and I think you would be a good person to have an interview. There's one of the Town Sioux Falls and going out you can look there. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Anything we can do to continue supporting the arts and spreading awareness and education, I'd be glad to do that. Be nice, but more yeah, reach out. Do what you were doing. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Margaret. Yes. For bringing, uh, thank you for the fantastic presentation. For bringing the performance to, uh, to Brooklyn, do you have kind of rough estimate or uh, timeline for 2024? Yeah, we are looking at the month of March. We are always flexible in dates. Um, depending on what's going on in the community, we take a close look at community calendars. And so if anyone does have suggestions of a time when you think it would be a good time, we are totally open to that. Um, you know, if it has to wait till next fall, so be it. But we're working on that, and we're actually going to tour the theater right after this with Jeannie. So we're very excited. We're hoping to do it here on the campus. So. so I got exhausted just listening to everything you've done. <laughs> and by the age of 28, you have quite a resume. But just wondering how you do do it all. What is your season in Colorado that you're actually that is a great question because it's something I'm still trying to figure out myself. So at Dance Aspen, I'm hired um, in a buy and like two, there's two different contracts they send me per year. So there's six months each, um, one of which runs typically between October. So I'm actually going back tomorrow. So it runs October through March typically and we tour around and they usually give us a couple weeks off um, during which I come back to South Dakota, run my studio, have my spring dance recital at my studio, take my young dancers to dance competitions, um, and then I go back to Colorado and start dancing again at the end of May, typically. And then summer is a huge season for us. We usually choreograph a ton of new um, works during that time. We tour all over Colorado. We have the Old Dance Festival. Um, very taxing, so we have performances almost every weekend all summer. It is exhausting, I will say that. Um, just having a day to recoup is very necessary. This year, we were on a very tight timeline, so we had a performance in Denver on September 16th. On the 17th, we loaded in a car and drove from Denver to Sioux Falls, where we started creating our new, that piece you just saw excerpts of, on the 18th on Monday. <laughs> And then we performed that on Thursday of that week. So we started lighting on Tuesday. We didn't even, and that was one of the struggles we've been up against as a company is with these tight timelines of dancer availability. I mean, how could we even start to market that show? We didn't have a show. And now that we do, you know, this is one of our most unique shows. This is a show, this choreography, the pieces that we performed in our recent performance, we want to take around South Dakota. We want other people, other communities to see this and experience dance in a new way. I think ballet can be intimidating when you're hearing about tutus and tiaras and point shoes and it's so reserved. And, but to be able to see human beings dancing, that is something anyone can understand. It's a universal language. So that's what we're hoping to do, but it's very tight. And hopefully we can continue to gather dancers. We have an availability for the next year to be able to work a little more. Ahead. What do you do to stay healthy? <laughs> Ooh, that is a really good question. So for me, um, I'm very blessed, knock on wood. I actually haven't had that many dance injuries. Uh, I think part of, part of that is being raised with my mom, who's taught me how to care for my body and do maintenance exercises, taught me how to train to return back to altitude. That's always a big one. 
Um, you know, for me, my most important thing I can do for physical and mental wellness is just getting outside. If I can be outside for 20 to 30 minutes a day, everything falls into place. Everything. And trying to eat cleaner, trying to make sure I'm drinking enough water, you know, especially working at altitude, I have to be outside. Even if it's snowing, I'm out there. <laughs> You'll see me doing cold plunges, whatever, I'll be out in that cold. I, just being outside, taking a walk, those are the most important things for me to keep my health and mental clarity. <laughs> yes? This might be something to think about for the future. Um, have you involved any older people? Like, um, In our performances? Or just a program exercise. Oh, we um, have not um, catered yeah. anything. There are like some really this beautiful whole room. Yes. 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 So one thing that um, is happening yes. in South Dakota that's really cool is Move to Heal South Dakota is actually taking on a lot of that. And that is their mission, to, supply, to um, provide wellness through the arts. And so it's a really unique organization if you've worked with them. That is part of their mission. And so we try to leave that up to them, but we definitely are interested in serving all um, people. So. Yeah. We have a, a small dance program here at SDSU. Have you had any contact with... We're going to do we're headed there next. <laughs> yes, we're headed there next. We're really excited. I have two of my former students who just joined the dance minor program here. So I really encouraged it their freshman year, but they were a little intimidated moving away from home for the first time. Um, my dancers from Yankton, the two of them are now in the program here, and they're very happy to be able to continue their dance education. Nancy Lyons and I went to see their program in 2 Falls, and we were just astounded. We were just couldn't couldn't keep us quiet or, or poking one another. <laughs> so I am also really excited to see this maybe come here next year. And after going over to see the Department Arts Center and talk to Corey Shelsa and what was the hospital. And one thing we will be doing in preparation for our Brookings tour, because we're gonna make it happen is we are going to take anyone who's interested in just being a part of the process with us. Um, if they wanted to, we're hoping to form a Brookings committee. We want to form a little small committee in every single town we go to so that we can work together to help spread the word and just understand the ins and outs of the communities. You know, I don't live in this community. It's hard to know it with all the nuances and um, so forth. So we do have a sign up sheet here. If anyone's interested, we are so grateful. You know, no pressure, but even if you just attend one 10 minute meeting and share what you have your thoughts like we're so grateful for all of your support thank you very much one more question, one more question. well probably it's not the best question to end with but um you know i your mother said that uh, a dancer is like a mannequin mm -hmm. And um, I was wondering, uh, I thought it would be more um, sort of interactive where the dancer would, do uh, you have like a director and then? Yeah, that's a great question. So in classical ballet, I repeat the question. oh yes. So we were just commenting on my mom's comment earlier that she mentioned sometimes dancers can be like a mannequin. You don't get to voice or express your um, desires about the art form or about the choreography. Many times in classical, very classical ballet companies, a choreographer will come in and they will tell you exactly where to put your pinky finger, exactly where to look, and exactly what time to do that. Um, so it's hard to be your full self as an artist. And one thing that we do differently when we produce contemporary works like this, we come in and we collaborate. It's completely collaborative. So you're working with the dancers, you're like, does that even work for you? Like, does that step feel good? Does that even, does that hurt your body? And they'll be like, yes or no. And if they say, yeah, then you change it. And it's more about the people you're working with, not just about the product. And so that's one really beautiful thing we're having the opportunity to do at South Dakota Valley. Could you speak for a second about the rights of choreography and why you can't just do what you want? Right, so with classical ballet, a lot of the choreographic works just like a book or a movie are copyright, so you cannot infringe upon that. You are supposed to do this step exactly as is, or the, otherwise you will get removed from the role because you're breaking a copyright. So 
There are lots of details with that. You know, I mean, you want to be an artist, but as a ballet dancer, classical, like you do have to follow certain guidelines, and it is less collaborative. And so I think that there's so much opportunity in contemporary dance, like what you saw today, and also like working in a smaller classical company, like what South Dakota Ballet could become. If we were to present classical works, selecting works that honor the artist and respect the artist and allow them to explore their um, artistry. It's a very short-lived career, and we want to support everyone as they go into those new roles, so. Thank you. <laughs> yes. This also isn't a question, but um, have you ever heard of the book, Your Brain on Art? Oh, no, I have not. You have to. I will read it. I love stuff like that. It's, um, it's, it's kind of heavy, some of its actual technical terms about what happens in your brain, and they talk about art is I would love to. Why people like things, what happens. Nice, thank you. Your brain on art. I will definitely be ordering that on Amazon the moment we're done, so I love reading. So. Thank you guys so much for having us. I am so grateful to have been here. Thank you for your patience during my technical difficulties. It was worth it, because I really wanted to share those videos with everyone, so thank you. Thank you, thank you.